Where's my remote even? Got it? Yeah, we're good. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the 25th Annual Research Showcase. I would like to congratulate the New Jersey Department of Transportation on their silver jubilee of holding this event dedicated to research and innovation that has been applied to New Jersey's transportation network. Everyone, give the DOT a round of applause. 25 years. I am Dave Maruka, and I am once again your moderator. My apologies. <laughs> I just lost my spot, there you go. The DOT's theme for this year's event, Commitment to Safety which is a topic near and dear to my heart. I promised myself I'd put my hand over my heart. Cell phones, please, at this time, can you put them on mute? I've already done it early this morning because I'm usually the guy that doesn't turn it off. But if you wouldn't mind, turn them down, turn them off uh, for us, please. Restrooms, if you go out the door you came in and you go towards the back and make a right, there's restrooms there in that hallway. And also, if you go up the steps where we have that gorgeous banner of balloons, you can go up there. There's also uh, bathrooms up on the second floor. Exits. Please look around at your exits, where they're at. We have them in the back. We have them over here. And God forbid something happens, we want to be able to exit quickly, right? You can go outside. right out. If you go through that exit that you came in, right outside those doors, you can exit very easily. And this is a smoke-free campus. For the last 10 years, it's been not, uh, you know, you couldn't smoke here. And I was telling people, go out the door and smoke right out. No, it's a smoke-free campus. I learned that actually this year. If you have any questions regarding a topic, please go to the strategically located mics. If you look, they're on this platform over here. Uh, in the center aisle, which will be after our keynote presentation and the panel discussion. So you're going to have to get up and go to these mics right here if you would like to ask a question. Certificates will be provided for attendance at the end of the day as you exit the building. This conference provides two professional development hours for professional engineers. We're also making available AICP maintenance uh, credits for planners. 
Today's presentation and video live stream will be posted on the NJDOT Tech Transfer website after the event. I'd like to thank Civic Eye, who's up there, for their efforts in making this possible. Please do not bring food or drinks into the auditorium. Lastly, a survey of today's events will be sent to your email via SurveyMonkey. Please complete the survey to assist us in improving this program for the next 25 years. For welcoming remarks, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce Andrew Swords. Mr. Swords serves as the Director of the Division of Statewide Planning at the New Jersey Department of Transportation. In that role, Andy leads several teams responsible for a variety of transportation planning functions, including long-range, performance-based, and asset management planning, safety programs, bicycle and pedestrian planning, and complete streets, traffic congestion analysis, air quality planning, the Transit Village Initiative, and State Planning Commission coordination. That's a lot, Andy. The division also manages the department's research and innovation program, the state planning and research, that's SPR program, and the work programs of the state's three metropolitan planning organizations. Andy has 34 years of experience with New Jersey's DOT and is a licensed professional planner in the state of New Jersey. Let's give a warm welcome to Director Andrew Swords. Thank you, David, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. I assume you can all hear me okay. Yeah. Good. I'm going to try not to use my reading glasses. Let's see how that goes. So I think I'm okay. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Jersey DOT's 25th Annual Research Showcase. I'm really pleased to welcome you all to this truly one-of-a-kind event. Our research showcase provides an opportunity for New Jersey's transportation community to see the breadth and depth of academic research being conducted by our partners, the institutions of higher education and their associates. It's a unique opportunity, and so I'm glad to see such a great turnout. The theme of this year's research showcase is our commitment to safety. The strength of that commitment will be demonstrated throughout the day as we see the great variety of expertise and topics that we will explore together. This morning, we're grateful to have Dr. Allison Curry from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to serve as our keynote. Later this morning, we will present the Research Showcase Awards. And this afternoon's breakout sessions will enable us to dive deeper into the details of numerous safety-related research projects. But right now, I would like to acknowledge the people that make it all happen. Today's partnership is organized by the New Jersey DOT Bureau of Research in partnership with the New Jersey Local Technical Assistance Program at Rutgers University, better known as LTAP, at the Center for Advanced Infrastructure and Transportation, better known as Rutgers Kate. I would like to thank Janet Lelly and her staff at Rutgers Kate, especially Dave Maruka and Jessica Brown. I would also like to thank the manager of the Bureau of Research, Amanda Gendek, for her ongoing leadership. Thanks also to the NJDOT project manager for the showcase, Pragna Shah. I would also like to acknowledge the rest of the staff at the Bureau of Research. They are Stephanie Nock, Sneha Shah, Sue Rizzo, Priscilla Ukpa, Stephanie Potapa, Giri Venkitila, Kamal Patel, Mansi Shah, and our research librarian, Eric Schwartz. Uh, if, for those of you in the staff who are here, would you please stand so you can be recognized? Without a round of applause. I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge our research partners and express my gratitude for the value that they bring to NJDOT's research program. 
Without, without the efforts of the university staff, our principal investigators, all of the students and grant administrators, we wouldn't be here today to showcase our collective success. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge a few people for their ongoing support. First, thank you to Commissioner Diane Gutierrez-Scacchetti, Assistant Commissioner Eric Powers, and Assistant Commissioner Parth Oza for your attendance today. Thank you to Federal Highway Division Administrator Robert Clark and your dedicated staff at the Federal Highway New Jersey Division Office for your continued sponsorship of this program and the ongoing partnership we have. And thanks to you, today's attendees and presenters for taking the time to participate. I hope you all enjoy, enjoy today's session. So without any further delay, it is truly my honor to introduce the Commissioner of Transportation, Diane gutierrez Gachetti. We know how busy you are, and we are grateful that you are here today. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, good morning. good morning. As you can see, I'm a hugger, and the DOT has adjusted to that, so that's really a good thing for me. <laughs> but it is my absolute pleasure today to be able to welcome all of you to the special 25th anniversary celebration of the annual New Jersey Department of Transportation Research Showcase. I also would like to welcome and thank the Federal Highway Administration, Robert Clark, and his team for supporting and sponsoring today's event. It is great to see so many faces from New Jersey DOT, New Jersey Transit, our world of academia, and our transportation industry partners. I would like to thank our MPOs and our local public agencies for joining us today. I have uh, one other person I'd like to thank, and that is David Maruka. Um, since I have been coming to the research showcase, David really makes it an enjoyable and a relaxed and fun environment, which I think is key to good collaboration and success, right? David, he's honest and he's energetic and he keeps us going in the right direction. And the most important thing for me is that everybody here feel that they can contribute. And I think David sets a wonderful tone like that. So I would like to thank you myself from the bottom of my heart. So. I'll never forget the first time I came, he came up to me and he kissed my hand and said, thank you so much for widening the turnpike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it changed his life. He, that's exactly what he said to me. It changed, it gave me back so much time in my day. So that, that I will always remember because not everybody feels that way yet, but we'll get there. So since 2023, uh, it is a mile, marks a milestone year for the research showcase. And I want to take a little time to look back on how we got to where we are today and to envision where we're going. The first research showcase was held in 25 years ago in 1999 and was initiated by New Jersey reti DOT retiree Nick Vitillo, then manager of the Bureau of Research. The inaugural event was held at Rutgers University's Livingston Campus Student Center. The intent of the research showcase was to bring together NJDOT research customers and academia to generate ideas for future research and develop problem statements that would ultimately lead to infrastructure improvements. Over the years, the format of the event has varied, as did the venue. Research partners like the College of New Jersey and Burlington County Community College were among some of the host institutes. Then, in 2006, the showcase found a home here at Mercer County Community College, and it has graciously hosted us ever since. With the addition of a poster session and awards presentations, this event gives well-deserved recognition to the diligent efforts, determination, ingenuity, and curious minds present in this room today. Over these past 25 years, the research showcase has hosted a distinguished group of keynote speakers, including representatives from USDOT, the New Jersey Governor's Office, FHWA Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center, American Society of Civil Engineers, and corporate partners like LM Industry Local Motors. The broad range of knowledge and insight shared at this event demonstrate the collaborative nature of transportation research. The showcase is an opportunity for us to gather and focus on important transportation topics, such as equity, 
sustainability, and resilience, the evolution of smart cities, and transformative technologies like autonomous and electric vehicles. There is one thing that underpins all these topics. It is something that is baked into everything we do at NJDOT, a common thread that runs through every step of an operation, from filling potholes to replacing a bridge and even conducting research. It's also the focus of this year's showcase, and it is safety. NJDOT's number one goal is to provide a safe transportation system for all. That means residents and those traveling through the state, whether by car, truck, rail, bus, boat, plane, bike, on foot, or with mobility assistance. The research projects showcased here today and everyone in this room help in the pursuit of that goal. Throughout the day, you, today, you will see examples of how your findings can create opportunities for positive change and improve the quality of life in New Jersey. Your work is helping shape the future of New Jersey's transportation system so it can continue to become more efficient, more equitable, more environmentally responsible, and safer. Having said all of that, I hope that you know that the fruits of your labor have resulted in, to a large extent, the reduction in fatalities in New Jersey by approximately 18% over last year. That is a huge accomplishment. When we can save lives, even one, we can go home at night and feel that our day was a success. But research is at the foundation of everything we do. Without an understanding of the implications of actions, without data to support our decisions, we will go into a project with a lot of uncertainty. And in our business, uncertainty does not lead to safety. So the work that you will do here over the course of this morning, over the course of today and this afternoon, is, in, is just, it's imperative. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, because I have to tell you all, this is probably the last time I will stand before you as the DOT commissioner um, and my last research showcase, which I'm not going to tell you doesn't make me sad, because it does a little bit. Um, but sometimes you get asked to do different things, and sometimes you have to answer that particular call. I will always, in my heart and in my new assignment, look at how transportation is foundationally important to everything that happens in state government. You'll often hear me say that transportation is the one service everyone uses every day. It is the one governmental supplied service that everyone uses every day. And people have said, well, almost everyone, Commissioner. And I said, no, everyone. How many of you got an Amazon package dropped on your door? How many of you received the US mail? How many of you have an elderly parent or a homebound family member that receives meals on wheels? How many people of you have had your Walmart delivery dropped at your door? We are a transportation-centric society. We have used transportation in a different way, but we use it every day. And when I say in a different way, I really want you all to focus on where US DOTs are looking, you, not US, DOTs in the US, not the US DOT. Heaven forbid, I don't want to speak for them. That's Robert's job. <laughs> DOTs, across, <laughs> DOTs across the country are looking at something what we call the Moonshot Project. And I, I mean, I don't, there's Amanda. Amanda will become more educated on this as we go to the AASHTO annual meeting and we go to TRB. But the Moonshot Project really is something that will be research-based in a significant way. It is a concept that says the last thing we did together as DOTs across this country was build the interstate system. That was a long time ago. What do we do now? How do DOTs evolve to the demands of society today? And what you'll learn, and hopefully you'll be able to participate, and if not, we will make sure we bring it back to New Jersey, is we are looking at how we become a community-centered transportation system. We will always build highways. We will always maintain state of good repair. We will always replace bridges. We will always make sure public transit runs. But communities need our help. Today, the world is changing, especially after COVID. People bike more. They walk more. They find different ways to travel. And as DOTs, we have to find a way to build that into what we do. It's a little different for us, right? Especially New Jersey as a home rule state. We don't, you know, county roads, local roads, no thanks. We got enough of our own. That's true. We do. But some of those state highways are main streets and communities. And we need to learn to think a little differently when we're supporting them and when we're doing a project in their town. The way that's going to come to pass is through the research that we do that tells us what makes sense for a DOT to do when it has to shrink down to the community level and support them. It is critical 
that we understand the importance of complete and green streets. It is critical that we understand, who knows who Alice is before I forget, we understand Alice. Who in this room knows who Alice is? Did you ever meet Alice? I'm gonna introduce you to Alice. Alice is asset limited, income constrained, employed. Alice is gonna become a focus of DOTs. I take Alice with me everywhere in the car. And why do I do that? Well, Alice probably can't afford a car right now. Or if she can't afford a car, it probably isn't a very good car. And if she can't afford a car, it's because she can't buy insurance. She may be working two or three jobs just to make ends meet, but has trouble getting there. How do we help Alice? How does transportation play a role in that? Well, it plays a role in forward thinking, looking at what we can do from a design perspective to improve sidewalks, bike lanes, active transportation, in places we never thought we could. Now, we can't just go out and do that today because we don't have the data and the research to determine it's safe. But that's what I hope that all of you will think about today. When you're thinking about safety, don't think just about cars and trucks and motorcycles. Think about Alice and how we get Alice to her jobs. I would like someday for Alice to get out of my car. Not because I don't like Alice, because Alice really wants to be independent. Alice doesn't want to be dependent. Alice represents the working poor. When we build a bridge, if it doesn't have sidewalks on it today, when we reconstruct it, put sidewalks on it. I don't care if there are sidewalks on either side of it. Those can come later, and they can come much more quickly than rebuilding that bridge will. Think about things we can do to really improve the lives of those who struggle to achieve a quality of life in this country that most of us, if not all of us, enjoy every day. How do we help Alice get to healthy foods? How do we help Alice get to better education? How do we help Alice and through a transportation system that makes sense? I learned about Alice about a year, a little better than a year ago, from a woman named Stephanie Hoops, who is the director of United for Alice through the United Way. She has spoken at NASTO and many other AASHTO events because we are all focused on the fact that we have a responsibility in transportation in this area. And I hope that all of you, in your research and in your studies and in your thoughts and your collaboration, will continue to consider Alice as we make plans and recommendations and develop problem statements that make sense for all of us. And I will close with the one thing I always say when I see a group of this size. I hope today you will leave here with one new idea and one new friend. Connect with somebody you've never met. Find something that really resonates with you and take it back to your agency or your, your community and see if it's something that works. So I just ask, my last ask of you, is to leave here with one new idea and one new friend. And if you do that, I think as a community, a transportation community, we can do nothing but be successful in pro providing safer, more efficient transportation for all of those who need us. Have a wonderful showcase. Thank you so much for having me all these years. Thank you, Mr. Maruker, for being such a great facilitator. I wish you all well. I just got nervous all of a sudden after all those accolades. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that. The, uh, Commissioner, do you have to go? I mean, being the Commissioner? No, 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 I'm just kidding. Uh, because I've never gotten accolades like that before, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, haven't felt that important in a long time, if at all, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay, our final speaker for opening remarks is Robert Clark. In September 2013, Robert became the FHWA New Jersey Division Administrator. As a division administrator, Robert is the principal representative of the Federal Highway Administration in New Jersey and is responsible for administering the Federal Aid Highway Program in the state. Robert has been with FHWA for 19 years. Prior to that, he worked for the North Carolina Department of Transportation in a variety of positions. Robert holds a bachelor's degree in finance from Georgia Southern University and a master's degree in public administration from North Carolina State University. Please give a warm welcome to New Jersey Division Administrator for the Federal Highway Administration, Robert Clark. All right. 
So first question to you guys, how many of you attended the safety summit yesterday? Okay, that's gonna be funny. Um, last night, well the reason I say that is I, uh, I changed my mind on what I was gonna talk about today in the middle of the night. Um, I gave opening remarks yesterday at that summit and knowing that this is focused around safety, I wanted to share that same message, um, but add in where research actually comes into play and, and what we're doing USDOT-wise, Federal Highway, and the Volpe Center. Um, you know, ending traffic fatalities uh, around the country is our top priority. USDOT, Federal Highway, our DOTs. Um, fortunately, we passed the bipartisan infrastructure law, which seriously increased our funding. Um, our DOT has put it to good use. I, I can attest to that. Um, has anybody heard of the National Roadway Safety Strategy from the US DOT? Not many. Okay, well, I can tell you that's where we're putting a lot of our research money into. And what it includes is safer people. How do we get the message out? Requires research, guys. Um, safer roads. It's engineering, yet it still needs research. Safer vehicles, we talked about that. That's being done mostly um, by the corporate section, um, but we're building the infrastructure for that. Safer speeds, and not everybody likes to hear that, um, but you know, do we need to have 70 mile an hour speed limits? And I'm sorry, because you drive on the turnpike and I know you like to go fast. <laughs> but I, I'm just saying, you know, um, speed kills a lot of people, guys. Um, so we're looking at that. And then, honestly, post-crash care. You'd be surprised how important Tim is. Um, our DOT is one of the best in the country in training, like we've trained the second most responders in the country. And I, I want to applaud the MPOs, especially the DOT and, and the operations unit. They've done a fantastic job and we are nationally recognized for that. Um, here's something, and Diane mentioned this, um, we've seen a reduction in fatalities. This is third quarter numbers. Um, so let's not pat ourselves on the back right now. Um, we still have a ways to go. Nationally, we're down 3%. Um, just recently, we're at 17.7, Diane, not 18. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, but anyway. Uh, so we are making a difference. And a lot of that has come through the research that you all have done, that Turner Fairbanks, which is our research division, and our Volpe Center, which is the USDOT's research section. Um, you know, as we work to improve safety through equitable, and I wanna repeat that word. That's something that I know Diane has embraced um, I've seen it since day one, um, even before it was a thing. Um, equitable planning and programming of our infrastructure investments. You know, it's time now that we double down on transportation safety. We're making progress. Let's not stop. Focus your research on that. What can we do better to save lives? Um, Effective messaging. Um, Diane and I just had a discussion about that and I'm with you. Um, we can reverse the deadly trend. Um, we can shorten the term as we move forward in our ultimate goal of zero fatalities. I know that sounds ridiculous, guys, but we can get there. 
Um, we all have a shared responsibility. Um, our engineers, our researchers, um, even finance geeks like me, um, we all have a responsibility to do this. Um, so a as we're meeting here today with a shared goal of improving safety, and, and I was happy to see that we're, fo we're focusing on that today, um, I encourage all of you to share your ideas on what we can do together. The DOT, US DOT Federal Highway, my DOT, um, on what we can do better and change the safety culture. That's what it's gonna take, guys, um, changing that culture. So today, during this showcase, um, please think about how your agency your personal expertise your per and your personal responsibility. Say that again, your personal responsibility. Um, that's talking to your friends. I mean, if, I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, if I could go back to my 21 year old self, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't have lost four friends in traffic fatalities. Um, speak out, talk to your friends, have them talk to their kids, vulnerable road users. I mean, it's our responsibility, guys. Um, so, so reach out to people. I, I, wish I, I wish I could go back, um, but I can't. So I, I'm gonna end this with a quote from the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. And I'm, I have to read this so I don't misquote him. When it comes to roadway deaths, we have a crisis that's urgent, unacceptable, and preventable. We cannot and must not accept that these fatalities are somehow inevitable part of life in America. Keep that in mind and thank you for focusing on safety this year. And it's been a pleasure and I appreciate the invitation to speak. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Okay, our keynote. Our keynote address will be delivered by Dr. Allison Curry. Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, affectionately known as CHOP. She is also the Senior Scientist and Director of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Center for Injury Research and Prevention. Dr. Curry is an injury epidemiologist by training and her research focuses on the prevention of motor vehicle crashes and support of safety transport across the lifespan. Dr. Curry and her team have spent the last decade developing the New Jersey Safety and Health Outcomes, NJSHO, Data Warehouse, a statewide data source of traffic safety and health data that includes 24 million New Jersey residents and have published nearly 50 research papers using this data. With the generous support of the New Jersey Division of Highway Traffic Safety, her team is now working to establish the NJSHO Center for Integrated Data, whose vision is to reimagine how to collect, integrate, and disseminate traffic safety data. Dr. Curry is also the principal investigator of a large research program to support driving safety for teens with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, and Autism Spectrum Disorder their families, and the groups that support them during the learning to drive process. Please give a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Dr. Allison Curry from CHOP. Let's figure out how to get this thing to work first. Does this work? It's okay. Yeah, it should. Uh, it helps if we turn it on, right? 
turn oh, it on, right. yes. Then if you want to that do would that help. with the red thing, that's hot. I will do that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. It's, it's fun to be here um, and see all of these faces. I've been at CHOP now for 15 years um, over the river, but I am born and bred on Exit 14 in Bayonne. Um, and like most New Jersey teens, I did my share of pre-licensed driving in Wildwood, um, where my parents still live. Um, yeah, I know, did you hear the accent? No accent. <laughs> Only when I get mad. Um, I had my first driving lesson, no joke, on Tunnelly Avenue in Jersey City, where they, the instructor drove me straight to Tunnelly Avenue, so that was a harrowing experience. And then um, for my first year of driving, my commute to my high school in Staten Island was over the Bayonne Bridge. And for those of you who've been on the old Bayonne Bridge, you're literally going over like a blind hill at 50 miles per hour. So I do credit New Jersey um, for making me the driver that I am today. And I also know what it is to lose a loved one. Um, my best friend when I was 12, Maria, died um, in a head-on collision on the way to my house for a sleepover. Um, and so I do, she's my personal inspiration, and I really do see it as a personal honor to be able to contribute um, to um, keeping those in, you know, all road users in New Jersey safe. So my heart is in New Jersey, even though I'm not always here. So what I want to talk to you about today is really the power of data integration. And there are several recent um, safety strategies which have emphasized both the importance of data integration and using a data-driven approach. We hear that over and over to improve traffic safety. These include, we heard about at the summit, the safe systems approach, um, CDC, the National Roadway Safety Strategy, and even New Jersey Strategic Highway Safety Plan. I was very excited that data is a core emphasis um, focus area. Um, so I have been spending, the, my team and I have spent the last 13 years really um, with a labor of love thinking about data integration in the state of New Jersey. So I want to share with you kind of the vision that I had when I first started for the initial development of what we call the NJ Show Data Warehouse. Um, all of the data sources that are currently in the warehouse. And then I'm going to talk through some innovative features that we've, um, that we've incorporated and how it's enabled us to do some critical research and how we could answer just a host of unaddressed um, research questions around the state. And then my vision, kind of what we're thinking about now, and then, of course, a plug for collaboration. So one of the things that I noticed when I first got into traffic safety back in 2009, I, I came here from the, de, um, the Department of Health in New York City, was just how many crash studies um, used crash data in isolation. And I started thinking, well, the, you know, on the crash report, we really have like just the first few minutes before crash leading up to the crash and um, stopping kind of when the, you know, just after the crash when law enforcement gets on the scene. And from a scientist perspective, an epidemiologic perspective, when we think about the study period, we really just have a few minutes, right? So we're talking about a few minute study period. And I thought to myself, well, we have such rich crash data in New, Jer in, uh, New Jersey. And I was, um, did a lot of linkage projects when I was at the, um, the Department of Health. And so I thought, well, what if we can pull it back, right, and link these crash data to data that occurred way, or information that occurred way before the crash. What was the licensing history of the driver? What kind of adverse events? Did they have crashes? Did they have citations? Who are they? Where do they live? You know, what are their, their factors that might contribute, kind of these underlying contributing factors? What medical conditions that they have? And then way after the crash, what kind of injuries, disability, mortality? Where are they getting their short and long-term care? What are, what's happening after they get a DUI? All of this. And if we can do this and link the data, we're really um, e extending the period of study to a few minutes to potentially decades. And so we've had the great opportunity to collaborate with um, several governmental agencies around the state. So the Motor Vehicle Commission, the Department of Transportation, the Division of Highway Traffic Safety, the Department of Health, and the Department of um, uh, the Office of Information Technology to develop what we call the NJ Show Data Warehouse. Currently, the warehouse um, covers 16 years, and we're integrating 2020 and 2021 right now. And it includes numerous administrative data sources from around the state. And I'll walk through these. Um, they include the entire motor vehicle crash um, report data from the state, adjudicated traffic citations, which are all already integrated into the driver licensing data. 
the entire New Jersey licensing database, EMS and trauma registry, um, hospital discharge, so every ED, outpatient, and um, inpatient hospital discharge in the state, regardless of its um, regardless of whether it's a motor vehicle crash or not, so all hospital discharges. We also have 200,000 CHOP patients who live in New Jersey. And luckily, we have electronic health records back to 2004 from CHOP. We were one of the first adopters of, of electronic health records. And so um, we're, we were able to integrate all the childhood medical records into the database. We have birth and death certificate. And then I'll talk about this a little bit longer, but we have rich community indicators down to the census level. Um, so far, we have 125 million records on 24 million, million New Jersey residents. And in order to be in the New Jersey show, you only have to appear in, in any one of these sources. So we really tried to, like, my interest is in traffic safety, but I really wanted to make this database so we, it would optimize its use way above even traffic safety or injury. So, um, so if you are, say, born in New Jersey, and you have a hospital discharge as an infant, you're in the NJ show, right? If you were a bicyclist who have never, you know, you're 16 years old, you haven't been licensed yet, and you show up at a hospital, you're in the NJ show. So it has use for both traffic safety, injury prevention, and then even, even um, further into health services. And then it also follows individual over time. So the way we set up the, the, the warehouse is that on a day-to-day -day basis over these 16 years, for every resident in the NJ show, we can tell what events they got in. Did they get into a crash? Did they show up at the hospital? You know, did they die? Were they licensed? Did they have a suspended license over the 16-year period? And then I don't talk about it much today, but we also linked these entire data to the Medicare and Medicaid data in New Jersey. So we're working with um, researchers in Brown University to look at driving outcomes among older drivers with um, Alzheimer's and related dementias and the causal effect of medications on older driver outcomes. Okay, so why isn't crash data good enough alone to assess the traffic safety landscape? Why is it so important that we need to think about integrating data? So if you take one of the central aims in our field is to reduce the number of injuries, right? We see that in the Strategic Highway um, Safety Report, reduce the number of injuries. Well, the crash report doesn't even do a good job of telling us the number of injuries. And so it can't um, drill down to things like who's getting injured, wh to what body part, who's, um, what are the severity of these injuries. And one of the things we did was we looked at all injuries that were either on the crash report or in New Jersey hospital data. And what we found is that New Jersey crash data misses up to a third of all crash injuries. And the picture is even more bleak when we look at vulnerable road users. So when we looked at bicyclists, we found that 60% of bicyclists that were injured can't be found anywhere in the crash report. So I think this really speaks to the need to integrate these data sources together. Um, as was mentioned, we have um, conducted over 45 research studies all in New Jersey among New Jersey drivers using these data. And so this QR code, and I'm sure you'll have the slides afterwards. Is that true? Okay. But, um, but, but th this link goes to our homepage on the, on the CHOP website and will link to, to all 50 research papers. Um, if you can't access them and you'd like to, please contact me. I'm happy to send them along. But I do want to mention this one, which was... Um, we um, publish an injury prevention, and this is basically on the methods of how we developed the NJ show, really walks through how we conducted the linkages. Okay, so I wanted to give you a few of the innovative features um, of the warehouse and then how we employed these to do certain research, um, to address new research areas. And so first, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the NJ show, we, the way we set up the data really gives us this longitudinal perspective, right, over a decade or more. And so we've used it to this, for example, to do retrospective cohort studies among drivers with medical conditions. And particularly, I'm interested in driving um, among uh, autistic adolescents and adolescents with ADHD. We also have um, another paper coming out on depression. Um, but we can connect, or we did connect, um, the electronic health records back when children were two and three and four years old, right, to their licensing and crash outcomes among the state. And so if you think about autistic teens, right, 
the ability that, you know, one in 35 now teens in New Jersey are on the autism spectrum disorder or have autism spectrum disorder. Um, and the transition to adolescence is a really hard time for them. Um, they lose services. A lot of them report being um, socially isolated and not participating in community events. So the ability to drive really does have great potential to increase um, independence and mobility for autistic teens and ultimately um, quality of life. However, before we started this work in 2013, we knew almost nothing about autistic teens and driving. And in fact, these are comments from the scientific community from my, when I wrote my first grant in 2013, filled with speculation about whether autistic teens can drive. You know, highly likely that some teens with autism will become upset with the new experience of learning to drive. We have no idea why they would need to drive. Highly unlikely to improve their health and they'll, they'll, they're an injury risk to others. And so this really motivated me to, get to, to, to you know, delve into this issue and even figure out how many autistic teens are driving. And so what we were able to do is create a cohort of CHOP patients who were seen in adolescence um, were New Jersey residents, right? So we had 67,000 New Jersey residents. You can use, or we use the visit level codes and um, kind of known chronic conditions in the CHOP electronic health record. Um, and then we confirmed that which, ha um, which uh, children had autism and, and did not have autism. And then we were able to get licensing rates by connected to the, to the licensing data. And what we found was that 30, currently about one third of teens in, in New Jersey get licensed. One of the things I don't show here that was the most fascinating actually was that um, among those teens who get a permit, you know, autistic teens who get a permit, 90% of them go on to be licensed. Right? So it looks to me like the drop-off in licensing is actually before autistic teens even get behind the wheel. And so this is where we focused a lot of our effort now on figuring out that deciding to drive process and making sure that families and those that support these families feel supported in making the right decision for their family. What else we found that I show here, um, and these are, so these are adjusted rate ratios, and then the pink lines are for 12 months, the first 12 months of driving. And the um, blue line is the first 48 months of driving. This rate ratio of one um, would be that autistic teens and non-autistic teens have the same rate of crashes. So what you can see here is that when we looked at the rate of crashes is that autistic teens have similar to lower crash rates per driver than, than their non-autistic um, teens. Now, of course, we don't take into account that they might drive less, but what I do think this shows is that um, they're able to organically kind of um, modify their driving to ensure that, they're, um, that they're, they're able to be safe drivers. And so this is, you know, we, we have um, a very big outreach at, at CHOP, and so we have all of uh, web pages about learning to drive with autism and ADHD. And in 2022, we had 25,000 hits on our, on our learning to drive with autism page. And so I really do think this message needs to get out to parents and teens and stakeholders. Okay, second innovative feature I wanted to mention was the incorporation of individual and community level equity data. And we talk about equity a lot, both today and at the, at the Safety Summit. Um, many of you may know that race and ethnicity is not collected in the New Jersey crash or licensing data, and this is true in other states as well. And it's so important that we're able to look at differences in non-fatal crash outcomes among um, drivers in different racial and ethnic groups. And it, when, you know, when I went to the literature, I saw a few studies on fatal crashes that had used FARS, but very, very few studies that have looked at racial and ethnic differences um, among non-fatal crashes. And so even though this information is not in the crash and licensing data, it is in many of the data sets that are connected to the crash and licensing data, including hospital discharge, our electronic health record, and birth and death data. So we can use these data to get racial and ethnic information for the majority of, um, of licensed drivers. And so what I show here are licensed drivers just in 2017, this was what we included in this one paper, six million drivers. 77.3 were able to get a reported race ethnicity from one of these other data sources. Um, but it's really important that we don't do analyses just on this group. 
right? Because those that are uh, uh, members of marginalized groups are more likely to not be in this 77.3%, given that it's you know hospital data. They're less likely to go to the hospital, they're not gonna be here. So any kind of analyses that we do, this just complete case analyses, is gonna be biased, right? So it's really important that we capture these other, these other folks. And so what we've used is an algorithm that was developed by Rand Corporation called the Bayesian Improved Surname Geocoding Method. And basically we can use census data, the last name of a person, and their address in order to sign six probabilities, ooh, sorry, six probabilities that that person is in one of six mutually exclusive racial and ethnic categories, right? So each person gets assigned six different probabilities. They're not classified into one race, but we could use this information then in our models in order to get crash rate estimates by racial and ethnic groups. So once we apply this algorithm, and again, here, here's the source down here if anybody wants to read the paper, we were able to get it for the 21.6% uh, additional um, individuals. So we now have racial and ethnic information for almost every licensed driver in the state. The other thing we can do, and we did, is to geocode both residential address and crash location. Okay, so what does this get us? It gets us two ways to characterize communities of interest. We talk a lot about like needing to delve down into the community. One way to delve down to the community is where do crashes occur, right? That's like an urban planning lens. Um, you know, where, where, where do we need um, better guardrails? Where are the scary intersections? Where are the crashes more likely to occur? What curves, right? This, you know, you think a lot about infrastructure um, progress that we need to make is kind of through this lens. And there are tools in New Jersey, such as Numetric and Safety Voyager, that, that focus on where crashes occur. But we also need to focus on who crashes occur to, right? Where the crash-affected individuals live. If we have an educational program and limited resources, what community is gonna benefit from that educational program the most? And it might be different depending on whether you're looking at car seats and seat belts or alcohol impaired driving. The community that's gonna need that support is not the same, right? So you need to be able to know where people live. And that's really the public health lens. I'm a public health practitioner or a public health professional. That's really where our focus is. So, for, so here's a few examples, right? We found that in 2014 to 2017, there were a total of 50, about 59,000 drivers in New Jersey who had a child less than eight years old and were involved in a crash. And overall, 72% of those had child occupants restrained in a child re restraint system. This clearly tells us we need to do better, right? We want to get that number up, but, but where, do we, where do we start? Having an um, understanding of where people live um, gives us a, a graph like this, right? So this is the proportion of those crash-involved drivers that had all their children restrained. And you can see that it's very different for the lowest income areas in New Jersey and the highest income areas. So this is CRS use among crash-involved drivers that live in the lowest income areas, and this is the highest income areas. So it starts to get it like thinking about where we need, you know, to, um, to support communities. And then you can get something like this, right? Because we have the exact address, the census track of every driver, we're able to, to yeah, this is just a draft, so <laughs> don't try to find your census track on here, but you can look census track by census track, and what you can see is actually a wide variation of crash-involved drivers that had their children restrained in, in child restraint seats. So it really can delve down into the community level and figuring out where we have to implement and evaluate our, um, our public health interventions. What else it gets you is, um, is an understanding of um, different county, you know, diff different county level issues. So what we have here is just an example. I just took a, an example um, for Essex County. I should have done Hudson because that's my home county. But um, the rates of alcohol involved driver crashes, right? So among 10,000 licensed drivers living in, Exis, in Essex County, what is the rate of alcohol driver crashes by sex? by age, by race, ethnicity. So you can really get individual level and community level rates at the same time. And notice that we do use rates a lot here and, and, and 
um, one of the issues of using just counts, right, is that the biggest county is always going to look like it has the biggest problem. So we do use rates, and we're lucky in that we can, um, instead of using resident rates, we can use licensed driver rates, which also takes into account the fact that 20% of New Jerseyans don't have a driver's license. So, and this compares to, by the way, this is like New Jersey State right here. So you can compare each of the counties to the state level data. Here's another thing. I'm not going to go into the methods of how we do this, but you can actually use crash data to get a general, um, to get the prevalence of driving behaviors among the general population, right? So one way to do that is to stand, kind of do these observation studies where you're standing on the side of the road and you're like, seatbelt, seatbelt, not wearing a seatbelt, seatbelt. That, that's, you know, kind of an observational naturalistic study. There is a way to use these data to actually look at the prevalence of driving behaviors among the general population. I'm happy to talk about that with anybody as well, and I give the source down here. But what you see here is the percent of unbelted trips among New, uh, New Jersey drivers. So what percent of all trips in New Jersey are when level and figure out what this number is? And 2% doesn't sound that bad until you think of just how many people are on the road every day. And, and so the end behind this is a lot of unbelted trips, right? So if we're thinking about seatbelt interventions and what community might need more educational support, this will help with that. Um, the last innovative feature I wanted to talk about was we have detailed vehicle and injury data. So um, we were able to link all of the vehicles in a crash in New Jersey to their VIN data um, that's housed in the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's VPIC database. And so we have make, model, vehicle age, presence of safety features, um, presence of autonomous, you know, driver assistant features, assistance features. And we're able to figure out and we were able to figure out that the most vulnerable drivers, those that are young, those that are old, and those of the low socioeconomic status, the Alice's, are driving much less safe cars than, than other groups. And so what you can see here, this basically is the vehicles, uh, all the vehicles that were in a crash that had a young driver and drivers of different ages. And what you can see is that um, young driver vehicles are le much less likely to have side airbags, electronic stability control, um, and are much older than cars driven by other, um, other groups. We also mapped all of the ICD-9 and ICD-10 diagnostic codes to injury severity codes. So when we start thinking about what's the link between the characteristics of the crash and the vehicle, right, in that safe systems approach, we're trying to make, to engineer our way into safety as well, right? So when we think about, like, what are the vehicle designs that need to improve, you can get a map like this, which is basically this. This this is all of the um, all of the children that were hospitalized in New Jersey crashes in 2017, and what part of the body the injuries occur to. So you can link this back to vehicle information, to crash information, try to understand what the link is between certain types of crashes and injuries to the vehicle occupants. Okay, so um, of course there is several decades more of work, of research work that we have to do, that we want to do, that we would love to collaborate with you to do on this on um, on the NJ Show data. But one of the things that I, we have been thinking about, my team and I, in the last few years, is <clears throat> is really that we we have universal, we've had universal interventions um, that are known to be effective in place some for decades, right? GDL systems among young drivers, electronic device bans, seatbelt laws. These have all been in place in all 50 states. And yet, we still, especially in recent years, are seeing um, you know, also a massive increase in the number of, of crashes and fatalities in crashes. Um, and so the thing I, that I've been interested in and from a public health pers perspective is we really like need to move the needle at the community level, right? That includes assessing and reassessing the traffic safety landscape in every in every community, which is constantly evolving given electro, you know, electric vehicles, um, micro mobility users. So everything continues to evolve. So being able to assess the traffic landscape, locate specific communities in need of a certain intervention for a certain thing, right? So which communities need more education and potentially more um, CRS checkpoints, right, in 
what communities do we do we put those in? Um, allocating resources and countermeasures appropriately to those communities that are going to benefit from them the most, and then this is where data comes back in, right? To, to use data to evaluate the effectiveness within communities. And this is just an iterative cycle that should go on and on in, 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 at the community level. What, what this requires is for those at the community level, the on the ground professionals, to have data at their fingertips to help drive this. And so integrated traffic safety data like what we have in the NJ show is really help, could be really helpful for these processes but out of the reach of many traffic safety professionals, right? Like downloading data and figuring out CSV files and linking data, like that is not something that, that's not the charge of on the ground traffic safety professionals. But, but we're lucky enough to have access to that data and we've been really um, ch charged with and motivated to think about how we share that data to, um, with on the ground professionals really to support your day-to-day -day work around the state. And so um, coming in 2024, um, we will have a website um, for our new center that, that in collaboration with the Division of Highway Traffic Safety called the New Jersey Show Center for Integrated Data. Um, and it was mentioned like one of the things we're really trying to think about is reimagining how we're sharing um, data to support safe transport around New Jersey. And we would love to hear feedback as we kind of roll this out, as we keep to evolve it and make changes. But what the, um, the feature, the highlight of the, of the um, center's website is going to be an interactive data dashboard. And so you see up here all of the, this is kind of like the starting pages that we have. Um, there's an overview of traffic safety. There are profiles by community on road users and um, different driving behaviors. There's the ability to look at maps. We have um, pages on different vulnerable road users. So young drivers, older drivers, bicycles, um, and pedestrians kind of tried to mirror what the metrics were in the strategic highway safety plan. Um, using this tool, you can select any year, but so far between 2000 and 2019, 2020 and 21 to be integrated. You can select the road user, so whether there's a driver, pedestrian, or bicyclist, the county. So again, this is like fo the, this dashboard is focused on the person, which is very complementary to new metric, which is focused on where the crash happens. This is talking about where people live, what you know, the community safety level. Um, and then you can um, select crash category, crashes, injury crashes, and fatal crashes. And the, the important thing about this is all of the hospital data is integrated. So this these injury and fatal crash numbers. Um, rely both on the crash report and that that um, hospital data. So they give a much more accurate picture of injuries compared to crash data alone. And then you can look at kind of county level, at this um, demographic level, rates over time for each of this. That's This is just this one road users page. Um, but um, we'd love feedback as we start to roll this out on what is needed around the state to help drive um, action. Another example of what we're going to show, I, I forgot to say there's a whole page based on equity. And one of the measures that we use is called the com community resilience estimates. And basically, it's an indicator of community vulnerability. And what's really cool about this measure is that where most, um, most other um, community level measures measure things on the community, right, medium household income, this um, this measure actually uses individual, lev data, individual level data from the American Community Survey. And it's very interpretable as the proportion of residents within a community that are living with three or more of these defined risk factors. And examples of these risk factors are don't have access to internet, don't have health insurance coverage. And so we're able to look at each county. So this 22 basically is 22% of Atlantic County residents um, are living with three or more of these risk factors. And we can start to help communities look at the correlation between the equitable nature of that community and crash rates and, and their crash burden. And what you can see here from, this is Atlanta County, this blue one, but what you can see here is that these two are, are very much linked. Um, and also understanding what's in this, these risk factors also help like kind of inform what our interventions should have. So 
one of these risk factors that we don't have internet and non-English speaking, right? So if you're finding that communities um, that are in need of an educational or public health or traffic safety intervention are living in these communities, that's really important information to have. We shouldn't have a web campaign, right? Or we should make sure that we're translating it into other language or, or text into other languages. So, um, so, oops. So we, we also have the um, social vulnerability index and some individual level um, equity measures in here. We're happy to consider others if, if um, anybody has other ideas. Um, and then the last thing I'll, well, second to last thing I'll say is that the NJ show really is primed for research collaboration. We have several research collaborations going on now with, um, with um, uh, friends at University of Virginia, with Brown, with Virginia Tech. Um, and there are so many things to be able to look at that we haven't even scratched the surface of. So vulnerable road users, pedestrians, bicyclists, we haven't even touched these data because there's only so many hands. But, um, but the spatial distribution of crashes, like I said, we have both where people live and where they crash. So we had done a study that was just published, I um, can't remember what journal, but it was looking at um, how far older drivers um, crash from their house. And so there are a lot of states that try to place restrictions on where older drivers can drive, right? They say, oh, you can't drive more than 20 miles from your house. Well, the fact is most older drivers are getting in crashes within five miles of their house. So are we putting these restrictions in place that are limiting independence, but not really doing anything for crash rates? So, um, but the spatial distribution of crashes, like kind of this urban planning lens that I was talking about, we, that's not my wheelhouse. So we haven't at, actually looked at all of these data in that way yet. The link between crash characteristics and injury, so as autonomous features become more ubiquitous in cars, thinking about um, whether those features can reduce injury risk among, among um, crash uh, vehicle occupants, all of that's available and, um, in, the, in these data. We heard about post-crash care, so now that we're into, we are in the process now of integrating this EMS data, triage, where are people going? Where are they being taken? You know, what, what kind of other injuries are being seen on the scene in EMS that might not be captured in these other data sources? And then back to the recent safety strategies, right? They also, in addition to calling for data integration, are calling for improved collaboration between partners, this kind of cross-sector collaboration. And this really has been a wonderful opportunity for us to kind of get out of our ivory tower and, um, and, and collaborate with those on the ground around the state. Um, so, you know, the, the academic partner, CHOP, um, you know, we have research capability, we have analytic capability, we can set up these kinds of studies. But we really are so grateful to our governmental partners at the MVC, at the DHTS, at the Department of Health and the, and the Department of Transportation. And we've found that there are individuals at these, um, at these um, organizations that have gone over and above their job descriptions to help us get data. There's a person at the Office of Information Technology, her name is Nancy King, I think she might be retired, but she used to come in on the weekends when we first asked for data because she could only download the data by like last name, so she had 26 folders for 26 letters and 26 last names. She came in over the course of three weekends. I would have sent her wine, but I think it would have been a conflict of interest, but so I did it. But, we, there are so many individuals that we have worked with have just gone over and above to support what we're doing. We really try to send back the information too to make sure that the MVC um, and, and, and these, um, these governmental agencies are able to access the kind of work that we do. And also that they can show kind of the law enforcement right on the ground. Like they fill out these crash reports and they think like, what is this doing? Who is this helping? And we want to be part of that group that tells them that every time they fill out a crash report, it's helping us learn something to help keep, keep people safe. And I, I learned that from my time at the Department of Health in New York City when, when people were filling out the birth certificate. We went to hospitals and they're like, I don't know why I'm doing this. The form's too long. So really going back and, and helping um, the law enforcement community understand how valuable they are in the chain of, of this research is super important. We work with some small businesses, which has been super fun. I know nothing about making websites. We've learned how to make Tableau data dashboards, how to incorporate equity. And then, of course, the on-the-ground organizations. Um, I call out just one here, DVRPC. But this kind of wheel where we're able to make something and then they help us critically you know, evaluate it and, and make it better over and over and over. And so we hope 
that the, um, the data dashboard will become iterative. I mean, we're going to start at county, but our goal is to be able to delve down more into the community, um, even further than that. But we're starting with county. So, um, so we'd love to hear um, your thoughts once, again, we roll it out. And I would be remiss if I didn't um, mention the, um, the amazing sources of funding over the last 13 years that have been able to make this work possible. And you'll see it's a really nice collection of um, kind of foundation um, funding, funding from around New Jersey and federal funding from um, CDC, APHA, National Institutes of Health. Um, and so we welcome, of course, any comments and questions. Feel free to email me. Here's my contact information, and we would love to hear from people. We're very approachable in New Jersey. Talk on the <laughs> mic here. No. Uh, my question is, do attorneys, you know, when you deal with crashes, there's always lawsuits. Do attorneys have all this data in this New Jersey data warehouse? They do not. And we have very, mm, it's my back pocket slide. So <laughs> it's the one other slide I brought. So we have very strict agreements with all of the data owners from around the state about what it means to be a data steward. And so we are prohibited from sharing this with third parties. We do not. I actually don't even have identifiable data myself. Only those research staff that need it for the linkages of these data have access to that. So we're guarded both by memorandums of under uh, agreement and data um, use agreements with the state, as well as our institutional re board, uh, um, review boards at CHOP, at Brown, and through the Department of Health that really um, all kind of spell out how we safeguard these data at the same time that we're able to use them to make a difference. Okay. So no, the answer is no. <laughs> I think building on that question, I just want to ask about uh, how you link the MVC with the uh, medical records. It's probably social security number. Is that... I did not bring that slide, but I do have an entire slide on all the linkage elements in each of the data sources. Um, we do not actually use social security number, I think. We use a combination. And di so different data sources will have different information available. So we have first name, last name, address, date of birth um, to link the crash to the hospital. Sometimes we use like location. We use a number of different variables, not just one in any source. Um, mm -hmm. When we first linked the um, MVC and um, crash data, we actually used a deterministic linkage. Um, and so many of them actually linked on exact um, driver license number. Mm -hmm. And we, it was astounding. And what we realized is that uh, the MVC and DOT both double enter that number, mm -hmm. right? So it ends up being like a really good, accurate number on both no, ends. No. And so once we moved to link, because basically we link all of these data at once. So yeah. now we use probabilistic linkages, but we've done hand reviews, I've done validation to ensure that we're doing it with high quality. Okay, awesome, thank you so much. Sure. I had one question about the uh, data collection as well. Are you able to get any information from private insurance companies of some sort? Because I know in some cases, there might actually be crashes where it's not reported to the police, but instead it's reported directly to the insurance company because of no injuries of some sort. No, we have not uh, acquired that data or tried to acquire that data. You know, I, um, of course, there's always going to be crashes missing. I think New Jersey actually has kind of a low bar for, for police report, which is you know, $500 in bodily, in, uh, $500 in property damage. So compared to Pennsylvania, which like kind of requires a tow away and, and, and injury, I think we're capturing kind of a higher proportion of crashes in New Jersey. And also, the, the, you know, the, the most important public health metrics, I think, are injury, uh, are kind of injury based. And so these little fender benders that are occurring are, I don't want to say of less public health importance, but I, they're, they're, I think it would be very hard to kind of get that data. That's fair. 
Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Oops. Oh, it's on? Oh, okay. So in one of your slides, it said that you had um, information um, about 24 million people, um, all of New Jersey. So based on license, um, New Jersey licensed holders, um, anyone that could have been in an um, automobile accident, whether they were the driver or the passenger, which could be many of us in this room, how safe is this database that you have with our um, all our personal information against cyber attacks? That's a great question. Yeah. That's so, <laughs> so hospital data and hospital organizations are probably the most safe, you know, data fortresses that there is. So, because we keep PII on million visits per year of pay, of children. And so these, um, so our hospital is about as safe as it can be in terms of data, in terms of being able to safeguard the data. So they have multiple levels of safeguards of data um, that we have at CHOP, in, including, like I said before, the fact that only, there's only two individuals that even have access to that to PII um, to begin with. Everything in the NJ show that anybody looks at, except for those two individuals, is completely de-identified. So you would never actually know who anybody is. And there's no reason for us to know who anybody is. OK, so before I sit down, so you did say all this information that you gather is housed at CHOP through, at the, with the database? Yes. OK. And you're saying it's safe? <laughs> I'm just making sure. I'm saying because the chop. There's so many, is so many hospital, um, I, things that have with cyber attacks, with um, DOT, understand. other agencies. It's just, you know, a lot of people information have been stolen. Um, so it's just me being concerned no, course, about the safety. Of course. That's all. Of course. And if it's not anyone a, concerned about themselves, I'm concerned about myself. Yeah, My no, I totally understand that. Before. And, you know, <laughs> and, and to make progress in public health, there are like, you know, birth certificates and death certificates and lots of data that is very, very personal needs to be accessed by somebody in order to keep making public health um, progress. And so, but at the individual level, I completely understand what you're saying, right? And so the, ho the hosp hospital data and, and, and academic institutions take this extremely seriously of making sure that things are as safeguarded. In fact, we've had an audit by our, our, our IRB to ensure we're even following what we said we were gonna follow in terms of safeguarding data. So, um, so it's about as safe as it's ever gonna be, right? I mean, it, the MVC could get high cyber attacks, so it's not like it doesn't live somewhere else, but I, we completely de-identify it the minute after it gets linked, and nobody, including me, has access to that. Um, except the individual that that conducts our linkage. So, okay. but I think it's a really important question, and I think it's really important to balance the nature of of release. The the Motor Vehicle Commission has you know trusted us to be a data stewards uh, as, and agents of the MVC. So we constantly feed back and and look through and have our lawyers look through the um, the agreements and making sure that we're following them. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, thank you for a very good presentation. So I have one question. So your database include climatic conditions or roadway infrastructure conditions because those two things are also major impacts for crashes, right? So your data is include those or? The they don't, only because we haven't. See, so because we're externally funded, the way that I've been able to fund these data are through research questions, right? From the like National Institutes of Health. So if someone had a climate related question, we absolutely could link all of that kind of data into here. So I'd be you know, really interested if somebody was interested. So it's possible to link that in here because we have um, the, you know, the dates and the, but, um, but currently it isn't just, but only because we haven't done research on that yet. Oh, okay, okay, thank so you. So very yeah. possible. Yeah. All right. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. She's making her way to the front. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice to see you again, Dr. Curry. Thank you. You too. Um, it's been a while. So um, I had two questions, and you can choose to answer one now and answer one later, because I don't think we have time for two questions. Um, the first one, when you mentioned uh, the, the bicycle, uh, pedestrian bicycle data, um, you mentioned that 60% of the data is not in the crash reports. Usually, the crash reports reflect the crashes with a motor vehicle. So if you have any micromobility devices that are contributing towards these crashes, it will not be captured in the crash report because micromobility yep. devices are, as you know, considered um, considered pedestrians with a personal mobility device, right, in the NJTR1 report. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to drill down into the data to see which one of those 60% are those micromobility crashes? <coughs> We have not yet, because it, I, from my understanding, it relies on the ICD-9, ICD-10 codes, which I think now are, I think there's education going on in hospitals about the use of these ICD-9 and 10, or ICD-10 codes for micromobility, but back when we have our data, I don't think they're trustable. So the, like the, the micromobility injuries are something that I think we really want to do in the future, mm -hmm. but need the kind of quality of the data to catch right. up with it. Um, so so I'm, I'd love to hear your thoughts kind of offline about wh what year you think that becomes um, you know, most accurate or more accurate to be able to study that. But yeah, we would, I, you know, as long as the ICD-10 codes are in there, we would have the ability to capture all of the micromobility injuries. Perfect, yes. And the second uh, question that I had was specifically to do with the autistic um, mm -hmm. licensing that you mentioned earlier. Uh, and as I understand, because I have uh, maybe three or four cousins that are on the autistic spectrum, it is a really wide spectrum uh, with uh, the abilities um, varying drastically from one end to the other. Uh, did When you did your licensing studies for the autistic spectrum uh, disability, uh, kids, individuals, uh, did you take into account the, the wide range of the spectrum and the requirements for licensing for those? Yes. Yeah, so we looked at um, we, all of our uh, autism and driving studies are limited to autistic individuals with no intellectual disability. So, um, but even on your point is well taken, even with those without intellectual disability, there is a wide range, right? And so what we're really focused on is driving is not going to be for everyone, right? No matter who you are, um, autism or not autism. 67% um, of parents and teens on the spectrum have told us they're interested in driving and only 30% are getting licensed. So we're really focused on this disconnect, right? Licensing isn't for everybody. For some are going to have to have training and in public transportation, yeah. but being being able to support everybody and making their decisions on whether they want to be a driver, because what we hear from parents and teens are there's a there's you know the teens want to drive, but are limited by parental anxiety, their anxiety, the how many the fact that they have so many more lessons and that a lot of that isn't covered, so insurance um, kind of insurance um, concerns. And so that um, so we're trying to take into account the entire spectrum that some will be able to drive safely and some um, may look at other forms of transportation. And just an FYI, we might be reaching out to you to be on our ASD, ISD task force. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm looking forward to knowing what that algorithm is. <laughs> I mean, that acronym. <laughs> oh, got it. Okay, great. Let's Thank give you. Another round of applause. Thank you. Great job. Okay. And this is actually working out perfectly. When they said a 10 minute break, I'm like, that's not a lot of time. But we're actually going to have closer to 15 minutes. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to take a 15 minute break. Please visit the research poster exhibits located downstairs in rooms 116 and 117, as well as the NJDOT library. Thank you. Take a break. Thank you. Be back 1040, please. 1040.
Calm down, take your seats. We went from being ahead of schedule to behind schedule. But I'm used to this, so no problem. 
Welcome back. Our next segment will be a panel discussion on how is New Jersey Department of Transportation addressing safety. Panelists, please come up and have a seat. They've already done it. <laughs> it's in my script. I read what I'm, what I'm supposed to read. I will be the moderator for the panel. Each panelist will be introduced and will speak briefly about how their respective unit addresses roadway, roadside safety, and the work they perform. Once they have uh, all addressed safety within their area of responsibility, I will ask the panel group a series of safety questions, followed by your questions, time permitting. We did good in the first part. Hopefully, we'll do good in the second part of this morning. Our first panelist to speak is the Director of Statewide Planning, Andrew Swords, who provided the welcoming remarks. Please give another warm welcome to Director Swords. Thank you, David, and I will try not to wear out my welcome. All right, I'm gonna practice the technology here, okay. All right, it works, awesome. So um, I'm gonna just spend a few minutes talking some, about some of the overall trends in safety and sort of setting the stage for the additional presentations that we have today. One of the things I wanna note, uh, and, and Dr. Curry mentioned this this morning, we have some significant safety challenges in New Jersey. You can see the trend in fatalities over the past 20 years or so. And overall, there's been kind of a downward trend, but we, if you notice toward the right, there were some significant increases during COVID. Uh, COVID really hit us hard. But if you look on the further on the right, over here, you can see that the fatalities from 2022 to 2023, we have data from the state police that tracks every day. You can look a year past and a year back from that. Initial indications, as the commissioner mentioned, are looking good. However, we can't really count on this as being, you know, that we're out of the woods. We still have daylight savings time coming up. We have to see how the rest of the year looks, but initial trends for the current year are looking good. I wanna talk a little bit more about the safe systems approach that uh, Robert Clark mentioned earlier, because this is really important for us because this is a, the core of the new federal approach to safety. And uh, Robert mentioned all of these different categories around the wheel here, safe vehicles, safe speeds, safe roads. Safe roads is really kind of where a lot of our infrastructure work lives. Post-crash care, that kind of goes into what Dr. Curry was talking about with, with the, uh, the work going on in, uh, partly actually it happens with uh, incident management, but then also uh, in, in, in the medical, in hospitals as well. Uh, safe road users, uh, but I think part of what I want to clarify here, there are some principles to the safe systems approach that uh, we all kind of need to take to heart, and this is something we're going to be working, working with uh, in our area. Death and serious injuries are unacceptable. Humans make mistakes. Humans are vulnerable. Responsibility is shared. Safety is proactive and redundancy is crucial. So we can't just take one little segment of the pie and, and think that we're done. We need to work with others, other partners. And I think there's gonna be some additional work going on with Dr. Curry, there's other work. And you'll see this as we, as we proceed, how in safety we are not just sticking to the infrastructure side. There are now five E's that we have in safety. Um, there's the traditional engineering side, there's education, there's enforcement, there's emergency response, and the fifth E is equity. So this is really, you know, we, we have to look at all of these as we move forward with safety. So the next piece here is I want to talk a little bit about how our 
federal highway safety improvement program has evolved to meet our challenges. So if we go back 10, 15 years ago, we were having some difficulty in authorizing enough of the HSIP money. What we've been able to do uh, over the past few years is to really uh, increase the diversity of, of the, the categories that, of the projects that we look at. Uh, we are no longer just doing single hotspot projects. We have begun to look at systemic and systematic projects where we can use our data to identify multiple areas, multiple locations that share the same characteristics and apply similar treatments to them. And you're gonna be hearing more about these in, in some of the other panels, panelists that we have. So um, some of these things you know, include uh, vegetation safety management. Kurt's gonna be talking more about that. There's a great deal going on with technology as well. Piran's gonna be mentioning that as well. So one thing you can see is over the past several years, we've greatly increased the amount of HSIP funding that we've been able to authorize. And that's been a partnership with our safety area, working with project management, and also working closely with uh, Division of Local Aid, the Metropolitan Planning Organizations. We've really ramped up the local safety projects as well. Okay, so in terms of a little bit more about these systematic and systemic projects, what we're, what we're doing is spending more time on these because it's really a more proactive approach. So on the systematic side, we're doing centerline rumble strips, vegetation safety management. We're also looking at mid-block crosswalk improvements. Uh, every approved mid-block crosswalk, we're looking to, to make improvements there. So, and then in addition to that, on the systemic side, there's high friction surface treatment. Uh, which is which is very very helpful. Roundabouts are one of the proven safety countermeasures from Federal Highway. We have a horizontal curve safety sign program and a wrong way program. So again, we're moving beyond just doing hotspot uh, solving hotspot problems at specific locations. We still do that, but we also have to move beyond that into systemic and systematic improvements. I wanna talk a little bit about what our focus areas are in moving forward, because as we know, one thing we learn within in safety is we cannot rest on our laurels. Even if we think that the signs are looking, we're getting better, we cannot count on that continuing without a comprehensive and thorough and committed approach to move forward. So one of these is we let data continue to drive our work our Federal Highway Safety Improvement Program is data-driven. We will let that continue to, to uh, drive what we do and, and help us to uh, figure out where we need to focus. So if you see on the pie chart on the left, of course, the green part of it for drivers, that's gonna be a big piece, but we also need to remember, for example, the pedestrian side is a pretty, a very substantial uh, number of our fatalities, unfortunately. And then, in addition to that, uh, protect vulnerable users. That's a, a key feature of our work. It was anyway, but now we also are doing a vulnerable road user assessment that we are providing to Federal Highway, and that's gonna be a cornerstone of our work moving forward. And then I also have to note that you know, our ongoing work with partners is critical. This came up at the Safety Summit yesterday, and it will be, uh, you know, everything we do, we do with our partners on the federal level, on the state side, our metropolitan planning organizations, uh, our transportation management associations, the TMAs. There are boots on the ground for the Safe Routes to School and a lot of other work. And also noting here on the lower left, the DOT Local Aid Resource Center, that's really important because it connects to all our counties and municipalities and they're critical partners because they own a lot of the roadways in New Jersey. The other thing you can look out for is we're going to have a safety resource center. Uh, there's gonna be a website that's gonna be a one-stop coming on that as well. Believe it or not, I'm almost done. So the, uh, the last thing I wanna point is just sort of say 
how do we get to the next level? Um, we're, we're, we're doing a lot more than we were a few years ago, but we need to do better. Uh, our, we, as we know, safety is going to be an ongoing challenge for us, and, and we, need, we need the help of everyone in this room. We need researchers to, uh, to help, help with further data-driven research. One of the bedrock uh, pieces of information we have is the Federal Highway Proven Safety Countermeasures. You can see some of them here. Um, there's a lot more that can be done in these areas to, to help us uh, you know, better analyze what the problems are, come up with cost-effective solutions, and work with our partners. So um, there are opportunities for uh, researchers to some of it is, is actually not, you know, may, may be not very glamorous. Um, there's, there's things that can be done to improve how we do road safety audits. There's, maybe we can do a better job with our rumble, rumble strips. Uh, there's more that we need to do with backplates in New Jersey, certainly. Uh, but also, there may be opportunities to come up with new approaches that we haven't even thought of yet. And that's a key part of research as well. So I think that's it for me, uh, and I wanted to say the, the rest, sorry, um, moving forward, you're going to hear a lot more specific information from our panelists, and you know, I think you'll see the diversity of work going on and the commitment that they have to improve safety. So thank you. Our second panelist is Syed Kazmi, who is the Section Chief of the Division of Traffic Engineering. Mr. Kazmi has 24 years of core traffic engineering experience in managing projects within the most highly congested, I can't believe it, areas of New Jersey for the Department of Transportation. Syed has a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering and a Master's of Science in Transportation. Please give a warm welcome to Section Chief Syed Kazmi. Thank you, everyone. Uh, most of you from DOT probably know me from, from the very first day I've been in traffic engineering. And uh, it's my 25th year. And uh, today I'm be, I'll be presenting two features that Division of Engineering uh, came up last year and we implemented on Route 129 and Lailer, uh, intersection that uh, took a national attention for the most unsafe intersection in the United States, and uh, we've been contacted through our uh, Office of Community Relations. And uh, but the features I'm going to present today, uh, they were in the planning for a couple of years. But uh, once that issue came up, it was a perfect opportunity for us to present those features to commissioner and to the locals and. Uh, the, the two features that I'm going to present, they are more are interactive in nature, and they collect data from vehicles and also uh, detect the behavior of pedestrians and make real-time changes in traffic signal timings. So let me sh go from here. OK. The first feature is, uh, we call it uh, it's automatic red clearance extension feature which mitigates uh, red light running crashes. I'll go further deeper into these features once this is just introduction. And uh, it mitigates vehicle to pedestrian conflicts, vehicle to bicycle con conflicts. The second feature I'll be presenting is, is a passive pedestrian detection. Uh, this feature accommodates pedestrians with different walking speeds. Monitor pedestrian, uh, monitor pedestrian presence within crosswalk and sidewalks. And I'm pretty sure everyone is aware of the touchless, bur touchless button that's uh, installed in, during COVID er era. And before I get into this uh, red light extension feature, it is important to know how severe that issue is across our nation. The statistics in 2021, we had almost 127,000 injuries. We have about 1,100 fatalities. It's like three fatalities a day. That, that's a big number. 
and uh, okay this is the basic setup for our uh, red light i mean the red clearance extension automatic red uh, clearance ex extension i have something here notes here What you see in the red zone is it's, it's a detection area, and what you see in the yellow is also a mass detection area at the intersection. As we all know that most of our traffic signal crashes occur in this red zone at traffic at signalized intersection. The core issue is why we do we have those accidents? I mean, we have all the technology in the world at this time, and we're still having three fatalities a day. We took a very different approach. Of course, there is this advancement in technology, and we took a little different approach. We think, and with our engineer, the core issue is the common arrival time in this red zone. So what this feature engages and what this feature does is it changes the arrival of the two conflicting movements during that phase. So or in the, uh, regarding the jet, uh, regarding the yellow extension, the, which is we call it advanced detection, what it does is we are doing this with the forward fire radar systems. It picks up the speed of the vehicle and calculate the stopping distance of that vehicle. And once we know the stopping distance of that vehicle is beyond a stop bar or beyond intersection, then we know that this vehicle is not going to stop. This will blow the light. And uh, what this feature does is it delays the side street, which is a conflicting movement, for a few more seconds to cross this vehicle. So I have we prepared two videos in our office that will explain further how this operation works. And uh, let's see. Notice the green signal for Route 129 and the red signal for Laylor Street. Traffic is flowing normally along Route 129. Route 129 is about to receive a yellow light. However, a southbound vehicle is about to run the red light. Follow the arrows that will appear on the upper part of the map. All approaches see a red signal for a set amount of time, which is normal operation in this instance. Notice the vehicle running the red light while the opposing traffic on Laylor Street sees the green light before the vehicle has cleared the intersection. Unfortunately, traffic on Laylor Street has already begun moving, resulting in a collision. Notice the green signal for Route 129 and the red signal for Laylor Street. Traffic is flowing normally along Route 129. Route 129 is about to receive the yellow light. The red light will appear in about four seconds. However, a southbound vehicle is about to run the red light. Follow the arrows that will appear in the upper part of the map. All approaches see a red signal for a set amount of time, which is normal operation in this instance. Notice the vehicle running the red light. This time, due to the automatic red clearance extension feature, all signals are displaying red until the vehicle has completely cleared the intersection. This is the basic operation for uh, red light running extension feature. And uh, the red zone that you saw, it also provides a second layer of safety, uh, redundancy, uh, redundancy. So if there is a vehicle at the end of any permissive phase, or maybe the late arrival at the cross section, I mean, at, the, in, at the intersection, or maybe a bicyclist, it can extend or hold conflicting movement for a few more seconds to make sure the goal here is to clear the box before any conflicting movement. Okay, 
This is the second feature that I'm going to present. This is a passive pedestrian detection system. What you see in the purple is the arriving zone. It's all detected by a 360-degree camera. And uh, it detects the pedestrians by direction. It's not like somebody's going away from the intersection. It detects the pedestrian by direction and places the call for it. A button, a push button at this time are basically redundant. They have no meaning, but we keep the push button in for compliance reasons and also for reassurance. And also, if there is any issue with the detection system, buttons are still available. And they are also touchless buttons. So what you see here is Route 129 Layler Street. What you see in the green is it's a crosswalk area. This has also been detected. In this zone, in the green zone, we monitor the speed of the pedestrians. For some reason, if the pedestrian cannot finish their journey, it extends time for them. It holds a conflictive movement for another few seconds. It, of course, it's predetermined time. It's not like you can, someone can stand in the crosswalk and they can stand forever. But that's a predetermined time, and that can also extend the time for crosswalks. And so conflictive movement won't start. There is. This is for all the traffic engineers, including me. <laughs> and uh, when we design a traffic signal, we collect all kind of traffic data for our traffic volume, vehicle speed, everything. What you see in the red sometimes, this data take the back seat when it comes to pedestrian. We assume that everybody is going to use the push button. We install the push button. We have 3.5 foot per second for every pedestrian in Providence in the United States. So what this, what does this feature does is it basically compensates those assumptions. When we got into 129 Alela Street, we have senior citizen facility on one side. We have a low income housing on one side. We have a light rail on the other side, and we have a lot of retail on the other side. I can walk six foot per second. But I, we have noticed mothers with strollers, two foot per second, one foot per second. And that's where this feature comes into play. And designing a traffic signal, I think these features are so important to be integrated in our traffic signal design. In the last 15 years, we have seen the eruption of all the adaptive systems. And we implemented all over the United States the goal was, for all the adaptive system was to reduce travel time, having a bigger uh, green bandwidth, and uh, what do you call it? Okay, for most my time, my time is almost over, so. <laughs> so. Oh, give me one more minute. Uh, he, he, I, I can take some curve, so. <laughs> <laughs> so these features are very extremely important to be integrated into our, our, our systems, and we are also also in conversation with a lot of the adaptive vendors to integrate these features into the system. So in future, you probably see a lot more into the traffic signal systems, and we will be incorporating these features. And rest of my speech probably will be will give you more information. Please have concentrate on the yellow highlighted Thank cameras. You. In the center right camera, notice a pedestrian approaching the passive pedestrian wait zone. As the pedestrian steps into the zone, the pedestrian is detected and the zone turns green, placing a call to the signal so that the conflicting traffic stops and the walk signal is displayed. Next, in the center left camera, the pedestrian begins crossing and the crosswalk zone turns green. This continues as the pedestrian crosses to the other side. In the upper right camera, you can see the pedestrian being detected in the opposing pedestrian detection zone until the pedestrian leaves the zone and is safely across.
Sayed, you just gave me an idea. We can do that with the speakers where we can put the lights. <laughs> hold the light, hold the light. No, it's very interesting, very outstanding. Thank you. Very interesting. I loved watching that. Thank you, Sayed. Our next panelist is Kurt McCoy. Kurt, you're done, just so you know. Sit down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just bad joke. I apologize. I'll stick to the script. Supervising engineer for the Division of Operations Support. His primary duties include being the project manager of 10 to 20 active design and construction resurfacing projects. The resurfac resurfacing program typically completes 85 to $95 million in resurfacing, resurfacing contracts per year. Other duties include completion of maintenance work orders and can, that can focus on single intersection or striping upgrades. Kurt has a Bachelor of Science in Civil and Environmental Engineer and a Master's of Engineering Management. Please welcome Kurt McCoy. I'll do my best. Uh, I guess the pressure's on me to stay within my time now. Don't worry, I don't talk very much, right guys? Uh, well, thank you for letting me talk about uh, some of the things that operations done uh, does. I'm Kurt McCoy, I'm a supervising engineer, and I worked for the operations unit for over 20 years creating various road roadway projects, observing new project, project product evaluations, and overseeing construction projects. Well, there's some of the areas that operations addresses that uh, safety, um, New Jersey operations, uh, DOT operations, consists of the most visible day-to-day -day operations that the motoring public sees every day. The maintenance crews remove roadway debris, fill the potholes, complete minor sign repairs, conduct safety service patrols for broken down cars on high-speed roadways, and uh, completing mowing, mowing operations. Some of the areas that operations focuses on that uh, really improves safety in the state is winter operations. As you know, it's winter is approaching. The operation team with private contractors uh, are already prepared and having uh, equipment and material ready and stockpiled uh, to pre-treat roadways during a storm, clear the roadways, and salt the roadways to prevent icing to provide safe travel for the motoring public, even in the worst weather conditions. Well, the area I'm going to speak uh, further about is the vegetation management program. It's a new program that operations have taken the lead on in the coordination with various New Jersey Department uh, of Transportation leads, uh, utilizing HSIP funds that were talked about earlier. And the program's intent is to re reduce vehicle incidents off the roadway involving, involving trees and vegetation. Uh, our unit also uh, does priority construction projects. I'm not going to go too much in depth with that, but you see the types of uh, projects that we uh, work on. These are on-call contractors that can uh, report to an incident uh, when it occurs, whether it's involving drainage, uh, bridge, roadway, when guardrail and attenuators get hit, and as little as long life pavement markings is if an area is requested for improved uh, crosswalks and signage, we can get out there within a couple of days to improve an intersection when notified. Vegetation management. Why are we focusing on it? On interstate and freeways over a 10 year uh, span, data was collected on the, our highways and freeways uh, to understand how many accidents are occurring uh, with trees. So within that uh, span, there was 5,162 crashes that a vehicle has struck a tree. In those crashes, there was 114 fatalities. The program is slated to utilize about $3 million per year to improve safety along the state's interstate, uh, interstates and freeways. The brush and trees will, uh, within about 35 feet of the travel lanes, will be removed in order for vehicles to have a larger area to regain control. Our unit was able to procure funding to begin three contracts focusing on the vegetation management. 
The work will be done during the winter in order to comply with the bat restrictions and to remove vegetation close to the roadways and dead trees that are outside of the roadway. The first contract is gonna be on routes 42 and part of 55 and Interstate 76, which has an average of 90 crashes per year with a total of 22 fatalities over the 10 years. Contract number two is on Interstate 80. It was averaging about 57 crashes per year with a total of about 13 fatal with a total of 13 fatalities within the 10 year uh, study. Contract number three will be Interstate 78. Again, it's, uh, it's another 57 crashes per year, so it's uh, just like Route 80, and there's a total of nine fatalities. So our overall goal is to uh, get down to zero tree-related fatalities. It's achievable, and it's uh, uh, a, a project that is very well suited for uh, our uh, operations maintenance groups. This program will take many years to, for the NJDOT to complete, and e we are hoping that each year we will see the incidents, injuries, and fatalities fall until we get to zero. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. Have a good Thank you, Kurt. You are our savior of the day. <laughs> our fourth panelist is Sangaran Vijaya Kumar, who is a program management specialist three for the Department of Transportation. Sangaran is managing over 15 transportation infrastructure improvement projects in various phases, including concept development, preliminary engineering, final design, and construction. He has been with the Division of Project Management for over 12 years. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Singaran Vijaya Kumar. I can do it. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Yeah, my job. Good morning. I I'm a project manager with the uh, capital, project, uh, capital program. Uh, my job is to deliver projects. Um, so, Today I'm going to talk about the, um, how the NJDOT is addressing safety in capital projects. So, so, the, so here is the outline for my project, uh, uh, my presentation. Um, so first I'm going to talk about the capital project delivery process, and then I will uh, give some project examples uh, for, safety, uh, for safety projects. Um, so here is the uh, NJDOT's uh, project delivery process. Most of you <coughs> know, 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 know this uh, process. Uh, so there are five phases here. Um, problem screening, concept development, preliminary engineering, final design, and construction. So the limited scope projects may skip the PE phase. Uh, most of the project development work happens uh, within the concept development. Uh, we perform several safety-related activities uh, in concept development, and I'm going to talk about that in, uh, on my next slide. Um, so see, these are the key safety-related activities we perf perform during concept development. So the project team, including uh, designers, NJDOT SMEs and external stakeholders review safety management data. The purpose is to see whether this project, project is ranked high on the SMS. The project team will review crash data. The project team, project team will also review crash analysis and review crash diagram. Based on the analysis, the project team will identify some the project team also identify substandard design elements to check to see if the substandard design elements contribute to any crashes. Uh, based on the analysis, the project team will identify feasible safety improvements and, and include them in a project. Um, so here's um, examples. I have five examples to go through. I'll go quickly. 
<laughs> this is an implementation of road diet um, as part of a, a payment resurfacing project. Uh, it is uh, Route 26, Cox Road to Nassau Street in New Brunswick, North, North Brunswick, Middlesex County. Um, as part of the project, we include, included several safety features, but I'm going to highlight the, the road diet component. Um, what you see there is the, the, uh, the construction has been completed for the project, so what you see, the, the photo shows the pre-construction condition. As you see, the roadway has four, a total of four travel lanes and on-street parking on either side. So here is the uh, uh, post-construction post condition. Um, so the four travel lanes will be reduced to three travel lanes, and then we added bicycle lanes uh, to the road. Uh, the on-street parking will be maintained. So what are the key benefits? Uh, the turning movements can be accommodated uh, via the uh, center turning lanes, and we have the bicycle accommodation is included, and also this project is consistent with the, the Livingston Avenue complete street project. Livingston Avenue is the extension of Route 26. So now we have extended the, the infrastructure for the bike lanes. Uh, so from this point onwards, uh, bicyclists can ride bicycles up to, the, up to downtown uh, New Brunswick area. Uh, here is the um, second example. Uh, we're going to highlight the uh, construction of a roundabout. Uh, so th this, is, this will be constructed as part of the uh, Route 66, Jumping Brook Road to Bone Road, Wayside Road uh, project. Uh, this project is located in Neptune Ocean Township, Monmouth County. So here are the, the this project is in uh, final design and uh, construction is anticipated next year. I'm going to go over some key improvements. We have incorporated several safety impro improvements as part of the projects. I'm going to go some key improvements here. The, the Route 66 section from, from Jumping Brook Road to uh, Wayside Road will be widened from a two-lane section to four-lane section uh, for the, uh, to accommodate the operations. Uh, and there's a roundabout will be constructed at the east end of the uh, project. Uh, as you can see, there are five approaches to that intersection. There are three signalized intersections clustered together. So the project team came up, came up with the roundabout design uh, for that location. So here is the, um, the proposed condition. So, so we're going to have a two-lane roundabout with five roadway approaches. As you all know, the, the key, key, benef key benefits of roundabout includes uh, it, it, it reduces the conflict points, it reduces crashes, and also it improves the traffic operation. Example three. This is uh, to highlight the substandard weaving section elimination on Route 440 uh, in the vicinity of Woodbridge Avenue. Um, this project is a Route 440 uh, route 95 to Creel Street uh, pavement reconstruction project. Uh, this project is in, uh, in, located in Edison, Woodbridge, Port Tamboy City area, Middlesex County. Um, so this uh, weaving section, as you can see, is very short. It's, it's about 200 feet that between the on-ramp and the off-ramp. So that creating traffic turbulence and resulting in crashes. So as part of the project, that weaving section will be eliminated by eliminating that loop ramp. And that move will be accommodated by this new connection, uh, this roadway. So, so this, this off ramp move will be accommodated via this intersection. And so the vehicles have to come here and make a left turn. So what are the key benefits here? It improves safety, and also it improves operation in the vicinity of the area. Example four, mid-block crosswalk improvements. The purpose of the project is to improve safety at the existing 37 mid-block crosswalk locations in central region. This project is at the tail end of the limited scope CD. 
So at these locations, what we are looking at uh, installation of uh, RRFBs, hybrid signals, traffic signals, and improved signing and striping. Uh, so this example, when we were doing um, the um, project meetings with the uh, locals, uh, the, 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 the site 16, uh, the, uh, I'll go back. The site 16, 13 is located in the vicinity of uh, Greenwood Elementary School. So when we doing the um, public outreach, the Greenwood Elementary School wanted us to accelerate the, the improvements to the, uh, the existing mid-block crosswalk. So we, uh, we advanced uh, the delivery of the project through a maintenance work order. So I'm going to show before and after conditions. So what you see is uh, what is there now, and uh, here it is uh, what is proposed. So here you see the increased, uh, the, we have uh, additional signs. Uh, we have um, the flashing uh, bacons here, uh, rec rectangular rapid flashing bacons, and also here. As you see, the, uh, we have added signage, and also we prohibited parking in the vicinity so the approaching vehicles would know uh, by uh, the pedestrians are on the crosswalk. So the, the issue is um, the, um, the, the stop compliance, vehicle stop compliance. And um, so with this, uh, the anticipated key, key, the, here are the anticipated key benefits. Uh, it improves pedestrian safety, and also it improves the vehicle stop compliance. This is my last example. <laughs> Uh, example five. Uh, so this is the system, systemic uh, backplate pilot program central. Uh, so this will be implemented on Route 27 uh, in North Brunswick and South Brunswick townships, Middlesex County. Uh, the key safety improvement that we are proposing is to uh, is to install traffic signal backplates with re retro reflective uh, border. So the, what are the benefit, key benefits uh, that pr proposed backplates sh uh, should improve the uh, traffic signal visibility? Um, um, so the, uh, I'm done, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> just uh, ju just want to I just to to, con to conclude my presentation. Uh, I like to thank the project team that worked with me, including uh, designers, DOT SMEs, and external stakeholders. Excellent examples. Thank you, Vijay, very much. Outstanding. Very good job. Our last panelist is Mr. Hiran Kumar Patel who is a principal electrical engineer in mobility engineering and started with the department just over five years ago. He's a graduate of Rutgers University with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. He has worked on various projects focused on deployment of intelligent transportation systems devices statewide. He was also involved in mobility engineering wrong way driving and connected vehicle initiatives. He has a passion for the various communication systems used for the ITS devices, along with future technologies. Please give a warm welcome to Hiram Kumar Patel. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an honor for me to uh, sit here and present with such honor uh, mentors from DOT. Um, as you heard, I work for transportation mobility. Uh, there's a group named Mobility Engineering within the group. Uh, we are also known as ITS group. And to improve safety on DOT roadways, uh, we install, upgrade, and maintain various ITS devices. Uh, These devices include the first one is the uh, DMS, uh, known as dynamic message sign. Uh, this sign improves safety by providing warning message related to congestion, crashes, incidents, construction, uh, road closure, speed restriction, um, and weather condition, etc. The other one on the list is the uh, lane use control sign. This one uh, is the 
the latest one we install on root one hard solder. Uh, if you have driven on root one, you will, you have seen this sign. Uh, this sign provides clear indications to motorists whether the solder is open or closed. At the same time, um, it it helps us our, our traffic operation uh, to manage this whole solder dynamically as well. The third one is the uh, the camera surveillance system. Uh, it is a very uh, helpful tool for our traffic operations to manage or actually to view the traffic congestion in real time. And with the use of this camera, they can display safety message on DMS. Um, and when needed, they can dispatch uh, dispatch unit uh, if there's an incident on the roadways. And lastly, a truck rollover warning system. If uh, the system warns a truck, if the truck is entering on ramp at higher speed than they're supposed to and at, they are at the risk of um, rolling over. So other than that, our traditional ITS devices, uh, we are currently working on implementing a wrong way driving detector system. Um, so why wrong way driving system? Um, FSW estimates that on average uh, 360 people are killed each year due to wrong way driving crashes. Um, they don't really happen that often, but severity is it's, it's quite higher. Um, in New Jersey, on average, there are 107 wrong way driving crashes occur each year. So what we're doing here is uh, we are deploying a technology-based solution uh, which not only detect the driver, but it also alert the driver at the same time. It also alert the TMC, so we'll know what's going on on the ramps. Um, I'll talk more in detail how this system works. Uh, with the wrong way, the driver, there's always a concern, how do we protect or alert this driver? So what we're doing is we are working with Cisco, uh, which will help us to display a real time message on DMS, which can alert those driver for potential wrong driver coming towards them. Each wrong driving site has a connected vehicle equipment um, named roadside unit. What it does is when the wrong driving incident occurs, the roadside unit will send out the, pre, uh, the traveler information message. So vehicle equipped with the OBU will receive the message in their vehicle alerting them for potential wrong driver coming towards them. So these are the system components. Uh, on the top, we are using a thermal detection camera which detects for any wrong way driving movement. One at the bottom, these are the axis high def camera which helps us to record any wrong way driving incidents if there is any. One at the bottom is a, the LED illuminators which, which turns on when the wrong way driver is detected. It is a very helpful tool at the nighttime. You know, um, it helps the camera to record the event as well. And lastly, the legend with sign, uh, which starts blinking when the wrong driver is detected. Uh, there are three zones of the system. The first one is the alert zone. So as soon as the driver is in the alert zone, all these four signs which will start blinking, alerting driver that he's going the wrong way. Uh, the second one is the correction zone. Uh, this zone gives a driver an opportunity to self-correct himself and go back to the, to, to the correct movement of the traffic. And lastly, if the driver keeps going through the confirmation zone, system will send the message to TMC uh, via text or email um, and all of the stakeholders that we listed. Uh, currently, we are working on the wrong way, statewide wrong way driving CONOPS, which will help us to uh, tackle uh, if there's any wrong way driving system uh, uh, event. These are uh, our initial deployment for wrong way driving sites. Uh, in total, we deploy 11 wrong way driving sites. Uh, five of them are on Route 1, and six of them are on 295. NGDOD Smart Now, Smart Right Now, uh, we applied for a USDOD Smart Grant for implementing um, smart sensor for mitigating a wrong way driving events in New Jersey. We, uh, we want for a stage one. Uh, currently, we are working on stage one, phase one. Uh, we are working very closely with uh, Chivan and, and Dan um, for developing a toolkit which will help us to screen for a potential wrong way driving site. Um, we'll be meeting various vendors uh, to implement two sites for now. And for validation and verification purpose, uh, we'll be working with Dr. Jael and his team from Rowan Uni University as well. Um, there is a stage two of this grant. Uh, we will be applying for the stage two, which is a larger part for this grant, which will help us to 
deploy more and more sites uh, within New Jersey. So other than wrong way driving, uh, we are currently working on our initiatives for connected vehicle. Uh, we started learning about this technology back in 2020. Uh, thank you to TCNJ and Dr. Brennan, I think he's not here right now, uh, for providing us the facility where we were able to test and learn about this technology and small, slowly and gradually we started implementing this technology on our, on our construction projects. So I think everyone knows what connected vehicle technology is, but real quick, there are two main components. One is the roadside unit, which is usually installed on the roadways. The other one is uh, connect, uh, the onboard unit, uh, OBU, it's usually installed in your vehicle. This vehicle, this component, uh, this device is um, transmit and receives message 10 times a second. And with the use of this communication between the, these two devices, we can run various safety and mobility applications such as red light violation uh, warning, reduce speed, work zone warning, uh, spot weather information warning, pedestrian safety warning. Uh, we can even do V2V applications such as forward collision warning and uh, uh, blind spot warning. These are the uh, recent construction project where we install a roadside unit. Uh, in total, we install 150 RSUs, physical RSUs. There are 191 in design, which will be installed uh, in near future. Currently, we are just focusing on transmitting SPAT, MAP, and TIM, and receiving BSM uh, from, the, from the roadways. And lastly, <laughs> uh, just the field installation pictures from our recent construction project. The RSU right here is the RSU installed on traffic signal pole. Um, this, this is the RSU installed on our camera signal pole. These red placement you see, these are the location of the physical RSU we installed so far in New Jersey. We are currently working with Verizon and Cisco for learning about the virtual RSU. So what virtual RSU is, is we don't need this physical RSU uh, in the field. All the roadside informations are sent to Verizon Cloud and, all, and, 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 and th those informations are converted it back and send it back to the roadways. Um, Dr. Jean is work currently uh, from from Rutgers is currently uh, working actively with our uh, uh, Cisco partner and Dr. Benesla and his team. Uh, we are learning, looking forward to uh, learn from you uh, what NJIT do, is doing for uh, virtual RC as well. That's what I have. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you for your time. I find the ITS is fascinating, and I'll tell you, it's all about communication, and what they're doing is just unbelievable. All right. Thank you, Hiran Kumar. I'm now going to ask the panel group a series, maybe a few, of transportation uh, safety questions. Question number one, how does NJDOT engage with the community and gather feedback on safety concerns and suggestions for improvement? To start off, to start us off, it'll be Section Chief Kazmi. Okay, can you guys hear me? All right, good. I must say Division of Traffic Engineering is one of the divisions in NJDOT who interacts with locals, police departments, citizens, and internally in DOT practically on a daily basis. You can imagine we have almost, as Dr. Curry mentioned, we have 6.7 licensed driver in New Jersey, about 2.6 million vehicle registered vehicle. That does not include trucks, bypass traffic, and motorcycles. And just in comparison, New Jersey is six times smaller than New York State, with only 400,000 less cars. So you can imagine how challenging our job as transportation engineer, but in the same token, it's equally rewarded, rewarding. So I know today's theme is commitment to safety. Department of Transportation Engine, Department of Transportation four years ago took initiative, we call it commitment to communities. And uh, with one of our finest uh, office of community relation office that paved the path a seamless path, I would say, to reach for the community to reach out to us and for us to reach out to the community. 
and only division of traffic engineering delivered small and medium size, I will say, 2,000 projects in three and a half years. So I will say the, commu the communication with the community is the key, and uh, that's the direction we are taking as, as an agency. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next question, which is, can you explain NJDOT's approach to ensuring the safety of road construction and maintenance workers, as well as the traveling public during construction projects? Mr. McCoy, would you like to start us in brief? I got it. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, the NJDOT's approach for not only our maintenance workers, but our uh, road construction projects are a commitment with uh, our partners as the contractors and our maintenance workers. We need to have the right safety uh, equipment, uh, notifications, and we need to go out there at the right time and a smart game plan. Um, one of the things we do with our maintenance workers is they take a, a, a pretty extensive training course when they first start, and safety is one of the biggest things that they stress uh, for that, everybody, sh uh, including the motoring public and the workers, uh, should be able to go home at night and make it, uh, make it uh, a safe environment for them to work on. And not only that, uh, I know we do the, uh, we highlight the uh, safe uh, work, um, work zone uh, for the week. Uh, so that's what we pretty, we, we do. So we okay. just got to make sure we have the right safety equipment setups and be smart about when we're going out to do the work. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, moving on. Back to ITS. In what ways is NJDOT leveraging technology and innovation to not only analyze, but to respond to and enhance safety on state roads and highways? Mr. Patel, if you could just expand a little bit more. Yeah, I think David, I think whatever I cover, I think pretty much says, you know, it's all the devices that we use. It's not just collect the data, but you know, we interact with the motorists in terms of signs that we, we, we install, TMS, uh, lock signs. Um, even with the wrong driving, it does not detect the vehicle, it alerts them. Uh, it also alerts TMC as well. Uh, in terms of kind of vehicle technology, we want, we will have lots of data, uh, and that data will not only be collected just to analyze, but if there's events such as like um, uh, air, airbag deployment, we will know it and we can respond to that as well. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do, uh, near miss analysis, and you know, uh, we can, we will know such intersection, there's a lot of miss analysis, and then you know, we can address that uh, when needed. Outstanding, thank you very much. <laughs> and finally, our last question. With new innovative technologies and data science applications on the horizon, what is your vision for NJDOT in reducing fatalities and serious injuries on our roadways over the next 25 years? And Director Swords, if you would like to address that. Sure, so I think that um, we can expect 25 years from now that uh, autonomous vehicles will be a key, if not dominant, feature on our roadways. And connected vehicles will be, you know, omnipresent because that work has already begun, as, as herein noted. Uh, we're already uh, bringing in connected vehicles, and all new, all new vehicles you know, have the connected vehicle technology. So I think we will be there in 25 years. Now, just to note, four or five years ago, there was a lot of hype about autonomous vehicles, that they were going to be coming seemingly immediately, and that, that is you know, not occurring, but mm. The transition is happening a little more deliberately, but it's starting with the connected vehicles. And at the same time, there's a great deal of work going on on the autonomous vehicle side uh, to prepare. The other part, too, that we have a role within the research community is that autonomous vehicles 
are greatly benefit from having clear pavement markings. So there's an active research project right now that Rowan University has to evaluate the performance of pavement markings. And that kind of research can really help moving forward so that the autonomous vehicles can safely interact with the roadway system. If anybody else has more to add, feel free. Okay, anybody else on the panelists wanna? Or we can move on to at least one question from the audience. Someone have a, we have a you know, cadre of, of experts out here. Anybody wanna ask a question in brief? All right. He kicked us off last time. He's going to kick us off again. Good job. I have a question. I have a question for uh, project management. Uh, our bridge structures, most of the decks are in bad shape in New Jersey. How fast through the duration of your, from PE to f construction, does it take to do a deck replacement or a superstructure replacement? Um, okay. You're touching the, uh, the delivery process, concept development, PEFD construction. So deck replacement will be a limited, probably will be a limited scope project, so we can skip the PE. So from um, concept development, uh, two years, uh, final design, two years, it can go to construction in uh, four years. Four years? It can get to construction in four years. Four right. years. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, in the interest of time, we're going to uh, end at that point. I would like to thank the very qualified Department of Transportation leader. <laughs> on our uh, panel today, sharing their intimate knowledge and expertise regarding commitment to safety. Let's get, well, we already gave them a round of applause. If you have any other further questions, uh, if you have any other further questions for the panelists, their contact information is listed. Tell me it's there, yes. Uh, Information listed on the screen there. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. And once again, final thank you. round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have one last uh, segment. which is the awards ceremony for this showcase. We are now going to present the 2023 New Jersey Department of Transportation Awards. Here to present those awards is Dr. Giri Venkatila, research scientist for the Bureau of Research. Thank you. Yeah. Clapping early, Giri, that's a good sign. Or that could be lunch is coming. He is responsible for managing various research projects, developing research ideas, and serving as a subject matter expert for research projects. He earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in civil engineering. Geary has over 12 years of hands-on experience in transportation research and administration. Please give another warm welcome to Dr. Geary Venkatila. Thank you, David. You just gave me 10 minutes, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I know lunch is around the corner. I'll make it very quickly, uh, this award ceremony. First of all, Amanda and Pragna, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to present or uh, to announce the winners at our showcase. Uh, so during this process, I'm going to talk briefly about the award, and I'm going to announce the winner, and then I'm going to talk what are their achievements, then finally, I call the winner to the stage to receive the award. So please, we can just follow this quickly so that you all can go to lunch, okay? So, so it is my honor uh, to invite uh, Eric Powers, Assistant Commissioner, Statewide Planning, Safety, and Capital Investments, and Andrew Swartz, Director, Statewide Planning, and Amanda Gendek, Manager, Bureau of Research, to present the awards for the um, our audience. Yeah, please. So we have, David, you said 
last year we have four now we have five right so so we have five categories this this year and our first category uh, is outstanding university student in transportation research bureau of research selects one student every year uh, to uh, to uh, to encourage them who are working our research projects so to be selected for this project so the student needs to involve in our one of our research projects and also currently enrolled in a graduate program at the at the nj state universities so this year the award uh, sorry here it's, it's coming up yes so this year the award goes to alisa prasad uh, alisa worked in nj duty research project name innovative materials for quick patching and repair of concrete uh, she she had experience in concrete mix designs so during her work she innovatively designed 26 different mixes to uh, to repair the concrete patches and alisa also has four out of four gpa so far so bureau of research congrats her and wishes all the best for her future alisa you may come forward now and receive the award Congrats, Alisa. <laughs> Next category is Research Implementation Award. Uh, Bureau of Research announces each year or honor our principal investigator through this research award. Uh, this research implementation award uh, will be given to a research project which is recently completed or implemented in our uh, NJDOT divisions, or it has a potential to implement. So this year, the award goes to Dr. Ho Wang, Associate Professor, Civil and Environmental Engineering, Rutgers University, for research project, Energy Harvesting on New Jersey Roadways. So this project completed on, um, in 2022, and the project laid va various implementation phases. So the main goal of this project is to uh, find out various ways of energy harvesting on our New Jersey roadways, like green um, energy concepts, and implement these energy harvesting tools to uh, uh, for different various applications, such as traffic lighting, dynamic messaging, EV charging, roadside communication devices, and, and many more coming on the pipeline. So with that, I would like to invite Dr. Hawang Please come forward and receive the award. Congrats, Dr. Hall. Next, best poster award. Before announcing the winner, please give a big round of applause to all our students, poster presenters, for their effort to present their research um, for, in our showcase. So this year, the award goes to Alessa Avet Sangha from Rowan University for poster on properties of cementitious materials with reclaimed cement. So Alessa, please come forward to receive uh, the best poster award.
the next award uh, which is newly uh, recently uh, announced in this cycle research who actually the backbone of our research projects uh, you know they guide the research team and as well as help the research project managers to go technically the, all the projects smoothly so we want to honor uh, individuals who really help us in this process uh, by recognizing their research excellence and co um, collaboration and partnership. So this year, the award goes to Tom Boucher, Principal Engineer, Division of Construction Services and Materials, uh, for his work on uh, the evaluation of different paint systems for overcoating um, existing structural steel, which is a very uh, innovative idea or the scope of work that Tom developed uh, before we start the project. And during the project, he excel and cooperate very well with the research team. So with, uh, with all these efforts, this project also received national recognition by winning ASTO High Value Research Award. And uh, on behalf of Tom, Tom could not make it today because he has some uh, another uh, uh, appointment. So, uh, it is my honor to uh, invite Rajesh Kaberia to accept this award on behalf of Tom. Last but not least, Built a Better Mouse Trap Award. So Built a Better Mouse Trap is a nationally recognition program, so which is technically for encouraging the locals, uh, state governments to, uh, for their employees to come up with the new innovative ideas, how they do their daily work. So uh, even for uh, uh, NJ Stick and NJ LTAP, every year identify local government and also state employees, we encourage them to submit their new ideas. So this year, uh, the award goes to uh, Gerald uh, Aliveto for submission on Route 71 over Shark River Road Diet. So we also have a small video so that you will really appreciate the team's effort uh, on this project. And this project is also received national recognition by uh, winning the category in bold steps. So please give us a big round of applause for this NJDOT project. And we're gonna have a short video before I call uh, Gerald. So let me... Start? Okay. The Route 71 drawbridge spanning the Shark River runs between Avon-by-the-Sea and Belmar. It was constructed in 1932 and is one of the oldest drawbridges in continuous service owned by NJDOT. During the month of September 2021, it suffered a mechanical malfunction that caused it to close improperly, causing damage to the structural steel. As a result, the bridge was closed to both marine and roadway traffic while NJDOT looked at avenues on how to get this bridge back into service. Given its high profile location between two very busy shore towns, we saw a need to get this into service almost immediately. So NJDOT studied three alternatives to restore this bridge back to operational status. The first alternative was to leave the bridge in its post failure condition. However, there was a significant cost of safety associated with this. Ultimately, any failure could be catastrophic and lead the bridge to its end of service life. The second alternative was to restore the bridge to its pre-failure condition. However, this cost was in the multi-million dollar range. Uh, the economic impact of doing such extensive repairs would have required six months of closure for both marine and roadway traffic. And we had concerns with doing such extensive repairs on a 90-year-old drawbridge scheduled for replacement. The third alternative, which was ultimately settled upon, was the road diet between Avon-by-the-Sea and Belmar. 
This reduced the bridge to one lane in each direction and allowed NJDOT to properly balance the live load of traffic traveling over the draw span and keep the bridge in its post-failure condition while not affecting the safety of the growing public. So NJDOT settled upon the road diet as the preferred alternative to fix this failure of the drawbridge. We met with our local stakeholders and the communities affected to ensure that everyone was on board prior to us implementing the road diet. There was some initial skepticism, however, after the implementation of the road diet, we're seeing that a lot of those concerns have been ameliorated because we reduced the road to one lane in each direction, which allowed us to install a bike lane over a drawbridge, something that had never been done in the state of New Jersey before. In the past, drawbridges were off limits to, to bike lanes. And what we've shown is that a bike lane over this drawbridge has not only brought increased safety to both communities, but it's, it's really drawn both communities together and provided better connectivity for both pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorists. After the implementation of the road diet, traffic is moving even better than it was before. At a cost of only $150,000, the taxpayer got a huge bang for their buck from the implementation of this road diet. In the end, there were three takeaways from this project. The first is that we were able to further the department's complete streets program by extending bicycle lanes over the drawbridge between Avon by the Sea and Belmar. The second takeaway was that we were able to further the department's commitment to communities initiative by working with all of our local stakeholders prior to the implementation of the road diet. And the biggest takeaway, at least from an operations perspective, is that bicycle lanes and drawbridges can coexist. So given the success of the road diet on Route 71 and the bike lane over the drawbridge, we're looking to further this and install a bike lane and other drawbridges across the state. Yeah. Yeah. General, please come forward. Yeah, he already here. Yeah. Thank you, Gerald. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Andrew. With that, we are concluded at the 25th Research Showcase Awards. I'm on time, David. Don't crush me. <laughs> All right, at this time, we are going to take a 45-minute lunch break. There are two buffet stations. One is in the back dining area, and one is just outside these doors to the left. Please form two lines. There is additional seating in rooms 122, 123. Lastly, please visit the various exhibits and review your programs for the three concurrent breakout sessions, which will commence after lunch at 1 p.m. promptly. Depending on your interest, feel free to change rooms in between sessions. Thank you and enjoy your lunch. <laughs>